All right. Hello, everybody. I'm glad to be here and to share a little bit of uh, what we're doing with uh, Flux and, and friends and building a multi-tenant application platform uh, here at Virginia Tech. My name is Michael Irwin and uh, excited to, to be here and I guess in some part at, at KubeCon this year. Um, just a little bit about me. Um, so I, I've been full-time at Virginia Tech uh, since 2011 and I started as a developer and have kind of worn a lot of different hats over the years. And I've really found that my passion um, even with all my my undergrad and my master's studies have really been around human computer interaction, but where a lot of the research tends to go like with, um, you know, how do we arrange user interfaces and buttons and all that kind of stuff. I've really found that my passion is how do we use computing to help people do hard things in an easier way? How do we lower the barrier of entry? And uh, that's one of the things I really love about DevOps and cloud and containers and all this kind of stuff. There's a lot of complexity but there's also a lot of opportunities to, to make things easier for people. And uh, so that's something I'm really interested in. I'm also an adjunct faculty instructor here in the CS department. Uh, so I've been teaching about six years now, um, usually just one class a semester. And I'm actually teaching a Kubernetes class this semester. And uh, it's uh, pretty awesome. Uh, we, we've got a lot of great excitement and energy and everything. Um, I am pretty involved in, in the, the community as well, both uh, regional and, and national. I'm, I'm just starting to get into the CNCF community, so excited to do a little bit more of that, but I've been pretty involved in the Docker community. I actually am a recognized Docker captain, and uh, this picture here is uh, DockerCon 2019. For those of you that aren't familiar with it, um, they, they had their, at, at least at that time, they had the talks on the first two days, and then the top-rated content um, redid their talks on the third day and it's usually a lot more laid back and so i uh don't ask why but i had an inflatable dino suit in my suitcase and decided you know i'm going to start off my talk in an inflatable dino suit and it was it was hilarious it was awesome so um, the mc introduced me and i walk up and he's just like wait this isn't right and and i actually start giving my talk and uh, it was a perfect segue because my talk was containers for beginners and i'm like sometimes we have to shed the old things in order to do the new things and it, then i you know bust out of the suit and you know give my talk to, with it and it was it was it was awesome it was perfect anyways um <laughs> so here at home i've also got a wife i've got five kiddos ranging from 9 to 1 uh four girls and a boy and uh we have a lot of fun and who knows maybe some of them will uh ransack my presentation sometime um, in the middle of this. We'll see. But enough about me. Let's uh, let's talk about why we're here and what, what we're going to talk about. So here's the, the rough idea and agenda of, of things that we're going to talk about. So first off, why do we care? What are we trying to build? What am I doing here? Um, how do we define a tenant? And how do we define the configuration for the tenant? Where does it go? How's Flux fit into this? Um, we're going to talk about a, a landlord helm chart that we've built to, to help define that, that tenant config. Uh, I'm going to show off a little bit of our platform uh, dashboard that we've created, and then uh, I'm going to do a live demo because what's, what's a presentation without a live demo, right? And then uh, we'll talk about kind of next steps and where we plan to go from here. So first off, why do we care? What, what, what is it that we're trying to build here? So at the end of 2019, of course, right before the pandemic really took off, um, we had a process improvement initiative here internally within our IT organization, and uh, really anybody could pitch ideas. And I, I pitched this idea to more or less create a, a team, an organizational unit that provides application technology infrastructure and sh shared services for all of our development teams, um, both within this, this kind of central division of IT, but then provide as a service to all. So to the rest of the colleges and departments and uh, faculty, et cetera, uh, throughout the university. And uh, the outcomes that we're expecting was, well, hey, now we've got a single platform, again, as a service that people can run their applications on because we're... One of the things that we have is just a lot of snowflake systems. A lot of students that developed an application and it's running in a, a machine in somebody's closet that nobody knows about and it's not being maintained or, or whatnot. We just have a lot of these scattered around the university. And so what we want to do is provide consistent and common ways to do things so that we can onboard easier, we can train easier, um, we can maintain, we have greater visibility in what we're running, et cetera. Um, and there's a lot of other value adds as well. And, and we're hoping that by having having this, we can start to have kind of a single team that, that really owns this. And uh, we also wanted to get all the shared application development and deployment services under one umbrella. Uh, like for example, we're running GitLab and Vault and uh, we're still using Docker Trust Registry and we're looking to, to transition to Harbor here soon. Um, but there's kind of, you know, 
one person's managing this app and uh, two people are maybe may managing that app and there's not a lot of synergies and integrations between them. So we want to bring them all under one umbrella and kind of make it easier. So that's the high level goal, high level initiative of, of what we're, we're working on. And the, in human terms, um, what we're trying to do is really let application teams focus on their apps. Um, as we've been migrating to the cloud, people are like, oh my goodness, cloud is awesome. Oh wait, wait! Cloud is a big wild west. It's a huge toolbox. I have nowhere where, no idea where to begin. Um, and now all of a sudden, people are having to worry about cloud architecture and all the services. When do I use which service? When all this kind of stuff, and it's it's complicated. Um, and we want to kind of abstract that away to give people the ability and the, the benefits of the cloud without having to worry too much about how to actually do it all. Um, again, we want to lower the barrier of entry, support faster iteration deployments, etc. Um, and this last point is, is pretty important. We've tried to do this in the past. We, we were actually using Docker Enterprise many years ago, and um, it just wasn't really designed well for multi-tenancy. And uh, there were specific things, which I'll, I'll talk about a little bit later, that made that really hard. And, and so we wanted to start from the, design from the start, architect from the start, how do we do multi-tenancy? and uh, allow it to scale to the needs of, of a large R1 university here in the, in the US. So this is kind of what it looks like. And this is you know super high level, um, just diagram. And let me grab my laser pointer here. There we go. Okay, so we have a, right now we're, we've got one platform account and eventually we might have more, but as of right now, we've got one platform account and, and we're using EKS. We have various node groups within that for the, the various groups within our, our, uh, our university. And this is mostly for two reasons. One, cost accounting to know how much each group is, is costing for compute resources, but also two is security boundaries. Um, so that group A knows that only their applications are scheduled on their nodes um, and you know, group B, group C, et cetera. And then leveraging the, the capabilities already built into EKS, you know, a pod running in uh, in group B's namespace, for example, would have a service account that would let it uh, do cross account role assumption. And so if you know, group B decides, all right, I'm going to run my application here, but I need SQSQs or lambdas or whatever else, they can spin that up in their, their other account and uh, using the cross account role assumption, be able to access those resources. And, uh, and I'm excited about some of the other uh, new CNCF projects that might help make that a little bit easier cross plane specifically. Um, but anyways, so, you know, the idea here, again, is we've got a single cluster that provides all the compute resources for our containerized applications. And then if folks want to expand out, they can certainly do that. What I don't have pictured here is, you know, we've got, we've standardized the identity access uh, to, to query resources and the cluster, the logging systems to, to take the logs and to put them into uh, Splunk indexes or Kibana groups. So we're, we're kind of making a transition from Kibana to Splunk uh, and Elk stack to Splunk. And so that the all the logging is automatically vacuumed up and sent out. So we're trying to really make this the right solution and, and make it just easy for people to, to meet all of our IT policies on campus. Okay. So designing for multi-tenancy, um, you know, that's hard. And there's, there's a, a lot of things that go into this. And uh, we'll talk about how Flux fits into this here in just a minute, but every tenant gets its own namespace. And we define tenant pretty loosely in the sense that a tenant can be a, a single app or it can even be an environment with an app, uh, within an application. So for example, we've got some teams that have a tenant that um, has all their feature branch deployments. And so they do all their feature branch deployments in one tenant, but then their production deploys are in, go into another tenant. Um, node pools are, and again, I talked about node pools. Uh, we're, we're mostly doing that for cost accounting and, and security boundaries as well. And then GitOps, especially Flux, makes the deployment super nice and easy. Uh, we really like the fact that with, with using Flux, our repositories are the source of truth and, and that we don't have to figure out how do we get credentials to push things into the cluster? How, how do we secure them in our, our pipelines, et cetera? We can just say, here's, here's a place to define your manifest and go. Now, we've got some teams that are, are doing full-on CI um, pipelines that are updating the manifest and pushing those into their manifest repos. And we've got others that are very old school and they're just like, I'm going to do it manually. And so it, it allows us to support a lot of different workflows for the teams. We just say, here's the place to put your manifest, 
and it's up to them to define how to do that. And uh, we'll, we'll see some examples of that here in just a little bit. This, this last piece is something that we've, uh, is another integration piece that we've created where we actually watch all of the SSH key or all the Git repositories that get created and the receiver objects. And we automatically sync the SSH keys and webhook configuration. So it just, it makes it super easy. And again, we'll see that when we do a demo. Okay, so let, let's talk about our, our tenant config a little bit. All right, the, when defining a tenant, we need to make sure that they're safe, they're secure, et cetera. So the way that we do that is we first ensure that they each get their own namespace. Um, teams with, uh, we wanna make sure that teams can see the things that they should be able to see, but obviously nothing more than that. Uh, we wanted to allow easy automation for the setup of the Git repository and receivers. So again, kind of like what I was talking about, we wanna be able to connect the SSH keys and, and web hooks so that when teams push changes to their manifest repos, they're deployed as quickly as possible. And we wanted to automate that as much because automation is a good thing. And, and finally, each tenant should have read-only access to their resources. So we wanna make sure that tenants can query things, but they can't change things without uh, modifying their, their uh, manifest and their manifest repo. Okay, so that, those are the high-level goals when defining tenants. And so how do, how do we actually do that? What we ended up landing on was a, a structure where we, we recognize that everything but the customization object, and, and we're, we're using customization objects, everything but the customization was something that only us as a platform team will look at and, and use. So what I mean by that is the, um, the Git repository and the receiver objects, okay? Those are something that we control, we own, we um, automate, et cetera, but we let the tenants see the customization object. And the reason for that is to help with debugging. If they define a manifest that has broken, um, a broken specification in it, for example, they need to be able to know that. And they can't know that if the customization object is living somewhere else. Um, and so we, we, one, that needs to be in, in their namespace. And then the, those other pieces, just to help support the automation, we, we put that together because, uh, for example, the Git repository, its secret ref to access its uh, SSH key is, isn't cross namespace. And so we, we had to keep those kind of all in the same namespace. Um, all right, so here's a diagram of what this kind of looks like. And again, we'll, we'll see this in action here in just a few minutes. So we've got a namespace called the, pl the Platform Flux Tenant Config. And in this, we define all of our, all the Git repositories and receivers. And I know there's lines galore here. Um, and so we've got a Git repository um, that's right now we're, we're sharing the SSH credentials across all the Git repositories. Um, and the receivers are referencing a, a shared secret GitLab token. At the end of the day, it's not really that secret, but if, if the GitLab token leaks out, so what kind of thing. Um, now, what this allows us to do is we can define additional repositories, receivers here, they share the same things. And then we have a, a controller that's sitting here and watching for the Git repositories be created. They say, okay, cool, let me go get the SSH credential and let me sync that key to that Git repository. So it just automates all that. Um, and then from there, the customization object is in the, the tenants and it defines what other applications, so their deployment services, whatever it is, ingress objects, I just threw a couple examples in here. Um, and so for the most part, that's, that's our deployment structure. Okay, nothing too fancy here. Um, now let me talk about how we actually deploy this and, and define this, because there's, there's a lot of different ways to you deploy containers, or sorry, deploy clusters, define them, bootstrap them, et cetera. What we did is we, we made a Helm chart that defines all of the configuration that's needed to define a tenant, okay? And we, we picked the name landlord because it kind of, one being in a college town, we have lots of apartments and uh, it just kind of goes along the, with the, the whole theme of tenants and landlord and, and all this kind of stuff. So we, we call it the landlord Helm chart. And it's responsible for kind of bootstrapping everything for a tenant. So creating the namespace, creating the Git repository, receiver customization objects, and, and the correct namespaces, and then also configuring RBAC network security policies, you know, gatekeeper policies, et cetera, which we'll, we'll see here in just a minute as well. Um, so again, we've got this Helm chart and I can give it a, a values file that looks something like this. Um, so I can define tenants 
And this is a tenant name sample one. And so that would create a namespace called sample one. These are authorized domains that that tenant is allowed to use. We have a gatekeeper policy that enforces that. Um, what node group um, all of these tenants should, or all the pods that spin up within this tenant should land on. Um, and I'll talk about that here in a minute. The operator ed group, um, logging, um, additional details. Uh, so annotations that we put on that our file beats will kind of annotate the um, log messages with. And, and again, we can just define the tenants in a values file. Okay. Now, we obviously don't deploy this manually because that breaks the whole GitOps <laughs> idea here. So the way that we de deploy this is actually using Flux itself. So we have a, a Helm release that says deploy the landlord chart. And we have a, a single Git repository that's here's the basically the landlord configuration for all of our clusters. So right now we have a development cluster, we have a test cluster, and we have a broad cluster. And all of our uh, production workloads, all of our you know in our, our actual tenants are in our in our production cluster. Um, and so within this this uh, landlord repository, we have subdirectories for each of the cluster that just contain a single manifest. And that's the Helm release. And that Helm release then has the, the values for what tenants do I deploy for this cluster? And that's pretty much it. Um, so when bootstrap in cluster, all we need to do is make sure that we de deploy the a Git repository and a customization object to watch the correct directory for that cluster. And, uh, and so I'll talk a little bit just about, and we won't get into, into details, into deep details anyways, but the way that we bootstrap clusters is um, we actually don't use GitOps for the, the kind of bootstrapping phase, um, but more for kind of the deployment phase. And what I mean by that is we, we use GitLab CI and Terraform to actually do the cluster creation setup. Um, so kind of phase one in, in the pipeline, the, the first stage is actually using Terraform to to define the subnets and the EKS cluster and the node groups and you know everything that goes along with that. Then the next stage, um, again, use Terraform, creates all the, the Helm charts and, and everything to kind of bootstrap the cluster. So with Calico and Dex and Flux and Gatekeeper and Prometheus, Grafana traffic, and those are just the, the logos here. There are more components that we have that many of which I just couldn't find logos for, but that's right. And, um, and so there's a lot of other components that go into to deploying our, our, our cluster. But as part of that, as part of that bootstrap, so again, phase two here, we define the Git repository and the customization object that then connects to the landlord, um, the landlord Helm release, okay? And so then kind of step three, which is completely out of bound, or, uh, yeah, um, out of band anyways, is the, the actual landlord deployment, okay? And again, we'll, we'll see a demo of this here in just a minute. Yep, I have an empty slide there, my bad there. Um, so to, to finish kind of securing our, our tenants, we did have to define various gatekeeper policies. And uh, if you're gonna do anything multi-tenant, get familiar with gatekeeper, get familiar with Rego. Rego is a language that takes a long time to wrap your head around, but it's super powerful and you can do some pretty neat stuff with it. Um, so we've got gatekeeper policies that apply the pod security standards to make sure that you know people aren't running as root or mounting host path uh, volumes, et cetera. Um, we authorize domain usage. So we saw in the, the example values YAML earlier, um, you know, what domains a specific tenant is allowed to use. And, and so that way tenant A can't define an ingress that then tenant B you know, should be having and we don't get traffic routed to applications, you know, people stepping on each other's toes. So we, we authorize the domain usage for the ingress and certificates. Um, we also ensure that all the customizations and home releases have target namespaces configured correctly. Um, and so that way a tenant can't say, well, I'm gonna create a customization and deploy somebody else's application here, or I'm gonna push my application to somebody else's namespace and maybe get a foothold somewhere else. So we, we make sure that Sure, you can define your own Helm release, but you're going to keep it within your sandbox. Um, and so gatekeeper policies do that. We also are playing with the, I, th I think it's still alpha right now, the alpha uh, capabilities in gatekeeper to, to mutate pods. And uh, examples of, of that are to mutate on annotations for our logging subsystems um, to indicate you know what Splunk, in, Splunk index various logs should show up in, et cetera. Um, and then also to do the, the node pool um, assignment. So we put the, the node affinities 
uh, on on pods as they start up. And that's something that, again, the tenants have no control over and we mutate that on and they're kind of forced into the right pool. Finally, the, the you know, accessing the cluster, since we're using EKS, we could leverage um, AWS IAM, but recognizing that we've got people from all over the university that might be doing this, we quickly realized that one, that would be a scaling issue of just how do we manage the roles and, and all that kind of stuff. But since we already have identity access systems here on campus, why not just leverage those? So we're currently using DEX and Cube OIDC proxy to, to authenticate people against our central authentication systems. And then based on groups that, that they're in, that then authorizes them to their namespaces and the resources that they can access within the cluster. Uh, we are looking to explore the, the relatively new um, OIDC provider support that was added to EKS so that we don't have to use the Kubo IDC proxy. The only thing I don't like right now is I can't specify my own, you know, prettier URL uh, domain name for that. Um, I don't want to have to give everybody this crazy AWS name for it. But anyways, that's a completely different topic. <laughs> um, and so again, this this access provides read-only access to our uh, for for our tenants to be able to query things. Okay. Now, finally, last thing that I want to mention, then we'll jump into our demo, is our little platform dashboard that we've created. As we've kind of scanned around the internet, uh, we've looked for dashboards to, that we can use, and there's not a whole lot in the GitOps space, especially that are read-only and kind of oriented towards those running apps. Um, you know, most of the Kubernetes dashboards are those you know, designed for those administering the cluster itself, um, and or using terminology that makes sense if you're you know a Kubernetes, a Kubernetes expert. And so we wanted to to do things to help teams debug issues um, and kind of help help you know why your app isn't working. So for example, if I have an ingress object that references a service by name that but that service isn't found, we want to highlight that and say, hey, you know, there's there's a disconnect here. You might want to take a look at this. And uh, and so I actually started working on a, a dashboard about three weeks ago just to kind of prototype things and and I'll show it off here in just a minute. But here's a screenshot of of it. Um, and so what we have here is up in the top left is the basically the customization object status. You know, the, the changes have been applied. Were they successful or not? What commit was it? I can open up the manifest repo directly from here. Um, any config issues, warnings, or um, info that we found. And then kind of hear from the domain. You know, this domain is served by these pods and the status for them and et cetera. So with that, I've got five minutes to do a live demo here. And what I'm going to do is um, we are going to actually start off by def uh, declaring a, a brand new tenant and we're going to deploy an application into it. So if I look at this, this is updating the um, Helm release object for our production cluster. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to define a new tenant called demo flux booth. And this is the operator ed group. So I need to be a, a member of this group to be able to access resources. And these, this is the domain that I'm allowed to, to use here. Um, one of my teammates already approved this. Normally he would merge it, but I told him not to merge it so I can do it as part of the, uh, the demo here. So I'm gonna go ahead and merge this. And what this is gonna do is obviously a webhook is gonna a trigger, the Helm release will get applied, the namespace will get created, the Git repository, everything will get um, configured and set up. And it's going to point to this repository. And what we should actually see here in just a second is I should see the webhook get configured here. It may take a, a few seconds for it to show up, but we'll come back to that. Um, now, so what I'm gonna do is in this repo, we're just gonna de deploy an application. And ba -ba 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 -ba, let me grab my pre-planned stuff here. Manifest.yaml is the file we're gonna, I do not wanna paste it in the file name. <laughs> um, and so I'm just gonna deploy a simple deployment service ingress and a certificate using the domain name that I was authorized to use by the, the tenant config. And I'll commit that change here. And uh, this will get deployed here in just a second. And if I refresh the webhook, for example, we should see, okay, yep. So our automation tool connected the, the webhook. And if I go over here now, so this is the dashboard, it sees the, the new namespace. I'll zoom in a little bit. And I can go here now and I can see that the latest change has been applied. We see the ingress object there, it's running my app. And then I see the uh, domain and path for the, the Acme um, pod that's gonna be doing the, the certificate um, 
validation, HTTP validation. Maybe I'll zoom out once here. Um, so my app is there. I can view details about it. I can open up the app and obviously the cert is still going through. So we'll wait for that for a second. But then my application here is just, you know, random dog GIFs and this is just my little demo app. Okay. And, and so one of the things that I can do is let's actually go back and let's break this. Let's try to use an ingress name <clears throat> I'm not allowed to use. So not allowed. Okay, commit the change. And we'll see this um, get applied here in just a second. Yep. There we go, applying updates. And the latest change failed to apply. And then if I open it up, this is a pretty ugly message right now. Um, because the gatekeeper, but it, it does tell me that the um, unauthorized host on ingress, uh, that this was an unauthorized uh, ingress. So I still want to do a little bit to clean up this message, but we see that the gatekeeper policy is in effect and is applying the, the changes there. Um, and then from here, I can kind of switch between the, the different tenants and um, get things working. Now I should be able to go back over here and my search should be valid now. Of course, Chrome probably is still caching my old one but let's try it one more time okay so yeah i've got a valid cert now and it's it's happy there so um and again so kind of recap what we just did there i went to my landlord helm release object defined a new tenant and it created all the namespace and all the different pieces that were needed um, and our automation um, connected our, our repository added the ssh key and the webhook to it I define my application and it went from there. Now, one of the things I'll, I'll show off really quickly is, so for this repository, um, you know, again, kind of going back to our original goal, we're trying to streamline and make things as easy as possible. And so we've made CI templates uh, in GitLab that with seven lines of config here, I, I'm including a pipeline here that will do a Docker build and then We'll actually go out and clone that manifest repo and use a, a manifest YAML file that I have at the, at the root of my project, do environment variable substitution and everything, and then put that into the the manifest repo, and uh, and I can, in this case, I'm providing additional build arguments to the uh, the Docker build itself. Um, but so with seven lines of config here, now our our tenants have a pipeline that can build and and deploy applications. And so they don't have to think much about the, that manifest repo or anything. It's just kind of abstracted away from them. And, uh, and so that's, that's what we've built so far. Um, so to wrap up, that's what we're going to see. Kind of just next steps. We are actually still kind of migrating off of Helm Release V1. All of our core platform stuff, we've migrated off of V1 to V2, but we still have some uh, of our tenants that are using uh, V1. So we're working with them on that. And then we're we're just continuing to onboard and uh, you know build out and productionalize, add support to our, our platform. Um, our team is still really small right now, and so we're we're looking at uh, ways to provide a little bit more support structure around this and everything. And uh, and with that, that's the presentation. And I'm I'm happy to take questions if there are any. I I, I don't see a lot of people there at the booth or, or whatnot or online, but um, you know if if anybody's got questions, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I should have put this on the last slide, but I'm. Uh, M-I-K-E-S-I-R-87, Mike Sir 87 pretty much everywhere on the internet. So um, I'm probably on Twitter too much at times, uh, but feel free to reach out and I'd be happy to answer questions and help anybody out. And with that, thank you. <laughs>